Romans. Today we are starting a sermon series that I intend will run through until Christmas, looking at the first four chapters of the book of Romans. And on Thursday evening, a number of us got together for our home groups, our, our midweek meeting, and we read through the first four chapters, or, and the first three verses of chapter five, if I'm being strictly accurate, of Romans, to try and get a sense of the sweep of it. And it was a good exercise. It was great to hear God speak to us, and I'm excited as we begin the studies in this book. And that comes not least as we look back through history, we see that people who have done great things for God have often spent time looking at the book of Romans, and God has left his gracious mark upon them as they've studied this book. I think not least of the great German reformer Martin Luther, who back in the 16th century was zeroing in on the 17th verse of chapter 1 and trying to understand what it meant when light bulbs went on for him. And he grasped how God could show his grace to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. What sprang out of that was then the Reformation that ran right across Europe, affected this nation too, um, not least because of the convictions that Luther grasped about God's goodness to him as he studied Romans. Or we'll take John Wesley, um, the great evangelistic preacher who preached right up and down uh, this land and also in America and had great effect. But it sprang from an occasion when he heard, it's a slightly strange meeting, they were reading the preface to a commentary on the book of Romans written by Martin Luther. And as it was read, I don't know how that meeting would go down. If I said, come, we're having a meeting, we're reading the commentary on the book of Romans from 200 years ago, and we're going to read the preface, how many of you will be here? But John Wesley was there. And he said, my heart was strangely warmed as I heard of what Christ had done for me. And what was the effect of the book of Romans being explained? It was, well, deep joy for John Wesley and a deep desire to see the good news of the Lord Jesus go out. Romans has left its mark on people through history. Uh, and personally, I was deeply affected when as a teenager and a guy in my early twenties, I spent a long time listening to preaching on the book of Romans. And through it, God's left his mark on me, I think. And it's my prayer that in the coming weeks, he will do the same. So what we're going to do this morning is, for the first six, seven minutes, I want to just try and introduce you to the book and answer the question, why did Paul write it? Because when we come to Romans, we're reading someone's mail, we're reading a letter. And as we read a letter, we need to be thinking, what's the point? But why is he writing it? So that we might understand it wisely and well for ourselves. Why is he written it? Well, Paul had never been to Rome at the point that he wrote this, probably around AD 67. Um, and, but the church that he is writing to, he knows loads of people. So if you were to turn to chapter 16, from verse 3 onwards to verse 16, you'll see a big list of names. People like Priscilla and Aquila, Epenetus, Mary, Andronicus, and others, other names that I will simply struggle to pronounce. But Paul obviously knows and loves lots of people in this church. It's a church he knows, at least indirectly. And there are people there that he loves. And he writes them this letter in which we find in all of the New Testament the fullest explanation of God's good news in Jesus. We find a number of chapters where he richly explains what it means to know and love the Lord Jesus. One example of this is trying to find the first time we find a commandment in the book of Romans. It doesn't come until he comes to the sixth chapter. He spends five chapters just explaining the good news about the Lord Jesus. And we ask ourselves, why? Why? Why does Paul, here is now, now I don't know if you're artists, I, I'm not. Um, and here are my best ever trying to just draw out what's going on in the book of Here's Paul, he's sending this letter containing the gospel. He wants to go to Rome to preach the gospel to this church, but we have to ask why. Well, mum's the word, or mum is the acronym at the least. He wants to bring about maturity, unity, and mission. Maturity, unity, and mission. So here is the church in Rome, over here, and he's logging that as he explains the gospel, he will help them grow up as Christians, that they will rise to maturity. 
Now this becomes clear. If you turn in your Bibles to chapter 15, verse 16 with me, chapter 15, verse 16, we see him explain what his job is as an apostle. Partway through, the sentence beginning, he gave. He, that's God, God gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. What's Paul saying? He's saying it's as I preach the gospel, as I write to you about the gospel, you will grow up. You will become mature. And that's what the gospel does to people who know and love the Lord Jesus. And so... Back in chapter 1, verse 15, he said, I'm really eager to come and preach the gospel to you who are in Rome, because he wants to help them grow up to mature. A very simple illustration of this would be, think for a moment, when you were first born as a baby, one of the key things that you did to grow up and mature was food. It's the thing you start out life needing. And as, as you grow up now, what is the thing that you need to keep maturing and being healthy and going on strong? Well, you need food, other things too, of course. But Paul knew that the gospel is not just something that people need to hear who've never heard about Jesus, but it's the thing that grows people to maturity who have heard him. And so as we come in the coming weeks to hear the book of Romans read and preached, we should be coming pleading, God, would you help me grow to maturity as a believer in the Lord Jesus? Would you help me grow up and would you feed me with the food of the gospel as we hear it explained in this letter? But it's not just maturity that Paul wants. He wants maturity that evidences itself in two ways. Unity and then mission. So unity first. Now, as we read through the letter, we find that there are two camps that are repeatedly addressed. The Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews being God's Old Testament people descended from Abraham. The Gentiles being everyone else, someone who isn't a Jew. And it would seem that there was some sort of um, division between these two groups. And Paul is trying to help them grasp that actually they are one and the same people. Profoundly different without the Lord Jesus, but made one family through Jesus. So as the gospel is preached, was he longing that they would express their maturity by loving people who are very different from us? And there are people in this church that will be different from you. And it is as we hear the gospel preached, it is my prayer in the coming weeks that we will grow in our love for each other and in our unity together as we hear Romans preached and hear of God's good news explained. Then, so Paul's writing about the gospel, he's wanting to preach the gospel to bring about maturity, unity, and to motivate for mission. mission. That's the, the drawing is complete now. So this is amazed as you will be with the drawing, okay? But I hope that Paul doesn't simply want these Roman Christians to be kind of comfortable and buttoned down and happy and stable. He wants to be thinking, hold on a minute, we've got other people out there who need to learn of Jesus. And again, right towards the end of the letter, chapter 15, verses 23 and 24, Paul explains that he's on his way, he's hoping to be on his way to Rome, to then go on to Spain. And this is what he writes. He says, chapter 15, verse 23, I've been longing for many years to visit you. I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and that you may assist me on my journey there after I've enjoyed your company for a while. And Paul's just laying out his itinerary here. He's saying, I'm coming to see you, but I won't stay with you forever because I want to go to make known the good news of Jesus. The news of rescue from sin. And actually, he's saying, I'm writing so that you'd help me out. You'd give resources. Maybe you'd give people to to come. Because the good news about the Lord Jesus, as it grows to you to maturity, will drive you out on mission to see other people come to know and love the Lord Jesus. And it's my prayer that as we look at the book of Romans, we too might have a loving concern. Whether you're called to go to Spain or not, I don't know. But all of us are expected to take the good news of Jesus to people who do not know me. I have a good friend who um, mentored me um, in my early years of ministry when we were in Newcastle. And he used to do a number of university missions. And one mission he did uh, with the Christian Union at Cambridge, they would invite the speakers to come and speak at a house party a weekend away, uh, a few 
weeks, if not months, before the mission began. And he went along with, with another guy called um, Philip Jensen, who was also doing some of the talk, on the mission week, as well as coming to speak at the house party. And he said to my friend Ian, he said, you, you realise why we're here? Because our first duty is to evangelise the Christians. It's to remind the Christians of the good news, the gospel. And that is our duty in the coming weeks, as we look at Romans, that we would be reminded of the good news of the gospel, so that we would be united, that we'd grow to maturity, and we'd be motivated to get the good news of Jesus out. And it's my prayer that God might help that come out. So chapter 1, verses 1 to 7, let's have a look at that. That's a bit of an overview of the book. What's, why is Paul telling them about the gospel book? Well, Mum's the act of maturity, unity, mission. Now, chapter 1, verses 1 to 7, we see him introduce this good news, God's good news. Uh, when I used to live in Newcastle, I think it was when Emily and I were married, we used occasionally to go to a modern art gallery called the Baltic um, in Gateshead, which is just the other side of the river. Um, to be perfectly honest, most of the times that I visited that art gallery, I was convinced that nothing in there qualified as art. It looked like a mess that someone had made on the floor, and that they hadn't spent much time doing it. That undoubtedly reveals to you that I'm not sophisticated enough to understand modern art. But there was one piece of art that sticks really vividly in my memory. It was an enormous piece of art. It was a tunnel that was about 8 metres in diameter and 20 metres long. It was shaped a bit like a, like a, like a bridge. So you went upstairs and you walked along a gangway, and then you went along and then there was a slide at the end. Whether that's the thing that really caught my attention, I don't know. But as you walked along this tunnel, there were embedded into the side walls of the tunnel dozens and dozens and dozens of television screens. And broadcast on each of the television screens was a different news network broadcast live in different languages. And then jammed into the walls of the tunnel that filled it out around the television sets was screwed up bits of newspaper. Everywhere. Noise everywhere, from every different inch. Things that you could read, potentially, that would inform you of things that have gone on in the past. I thought it was a great piece of art, at least this is what I understood of it. We live in a world that is bombarded by news. And the challenge comes is working out well, what's important for me to listen to. And what of these things affects me? What is important and what affects me? Well, as we begin the book of Romans, it's as if we're stood in that tunnel and these a myriad of voices are trying to call for our attention and then all of a sudden all the screens go blank and all of them pump out the same audio loud and clear. I interrupt this broadcast to bring you an important, though the most important announcement that's ever been heard. It's because I bring you God's good news. Are you listening? I said, are you listening? So in a world bombarded by news, we find Romans interrupt and God speak. And the question is, are we listening? And the reason we should want to is because God's news he brings is really good news. It's really good news. Five brief things to spot as we go through about this good news. First up, it is God's good news. Look at verse 1 of Romans chapter 1. Um, if I was fallen shut, you might want to turn back to page 1128 with me. Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, just to say, if you've never looked in the Bible, the chapters there listed by the big numbers and the verses by the little numbers. So right next to the big number, 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. As we begin the letter, Paul is crystal clear on his role, isn't he? He sees himself as a servant, a literary, a slave, and someone who's been set apart as an apostle, someone who speaks with God's authority. And the message he brings is not an unimportant message, but a staggeringly important message, because it is God's gospel. This is what God wants to say, and he wants us to hear it. A very simple observation, just as we start, that if this is God's gospel, how we respond to what God says here is a pretty good barometer of what we think of God himself. 
And so if we accept and love what he says here, that's a good indication that we accept and love God. If we reject what we find here, well, we can draw the conclusions, can't we? And so as we work our way through, in moments when we find parts of Romans contend with us and leave us feeling deeply uncomfortable because it causes us to change things that are dear to us, we should probably understand that that is God saying to us, lovingly there are things that need to change. In moments when we find things that delight and make our hearts rejoice and our souls sing, we should remember that that is God speaking to us, who loves us. And please don't be surprised if, it, as we come to Romans this week, and to look at God's good news here, that we find our minds stretched. Because if this is God's gospel, then we must grasp that there are things that we will struggle to comprehend because God is infinite and we are finite. And we should want our minds stretched so that we grasp more fully how much God loves us. But note, please, that this gospel is not just God's news, it's God's good news because it announces rescue. A couple of years ago, I had the delight of reading a book um, by a lady called Laura, Laura Hillenbrands called Unbroken. It is the biography of a man called Louis Zamperini, who had lived just the most staggering life. It's an excellent book to read. But part of his life during the Second World War, he was a bombardier, the guy who worked out when to drop the bombs in a Liberator, a B-24. Uh, one, year, one day when he was flying over the Pacific, his, his plane had to be ditched, and he ended up being taken as a prisoner of war in Japan. Life was grim for a long time for Zamperini and his fellow prisoners. Um, as the war wound on, it was clear from what they could hear, even in their prison, that the war had reached Japan. They heard fighting, they heard bombing, but they didn't know what was happening. And then one day all the guards melted away. And then they heard the news. It was announced to them. I can't remember how, whether it was radio or someone came. And they announced the news that America had won and Japan had surrendered. They were free. They were free. And there's this great vivid scene of um, these prisoners, gaunt and skinny, swimming in a local river. And then a, a, an American fighter plane flying over and realising who was there and kind of doing aerobatics. A sense of celebration and joy at the news that had been announced. And as we read this gospel, God says there is good news. Because our plight without Jesus is worse than Zamperini's in prison. Our plight without Jesus sees us lost in our sins. And so what does God say to us? He says... I interrupt this broadcast to bring you a very important announcement that I'm bringing rescue your way and it comes through my son. Will you listen? Will you listen? And it's as we listen to this glorious good news that we are motivated to love Jesus more and go out on mission, aren't we? we want, if we grasp what's come to us through Jesus, do we not want others to benefit from these things? Surely we do. Surely we do. And it, just one brief thing. If you have ever spoken to someone about the Lord Jesus and they haven't necessarily liked what you have explained, can I simply say this? If the gospel is God's gospel, note where the buck stops with the message that is announced. It doesn't stop with you. You didn't make up the message. The buck ultimately stops with God. If people take issue with what the gospel would say, they take issue with God himself. So we need to kindly, but clearly, explain that this is actually, this is what God says. And God does call us to understand and respond to the good news he brings. So here, God's good news. It comes from God and it is good. And it's news we need to hear. Secondly, we need to see that we must pay attention to this message because it is unchanging good news. Unchanging good news. Look down to verse 2, little number 2. The gospel God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David. The good news that Paul is speaking about is not new news. It's actually old news. 
because it's something that has been promised from long ago. Uh, So you saw there the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets. Now, please don't think that that just limits it to kind of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and maybe one or two others. Actually, the whole of the Old Testament is profoundly prophetic. So Martin Luther, that German reformer we mentioned earlier, once said, he said, Scripture is completely prophetical. It, It prophesies, it tells of what's coming in Jesus. So think all the way back to the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, God speaks a word of promise to Eve that she's going to give birth to a child who will then have a descendant in the future who will grind Satan's head into the ground, who will defeat the serpents. Chapter 3 of Genesis. Go all the way to the end of the Old Testament and there we find in Malachi, the last chapter, a promise of one coming, a, a greater prophet, a greater Elijah coming who will turn the hearts of people back to God. And right in the middle of the Old Testament is King David, who's referenced here, who's promised a king who would come to reign on God's throne forever. So the message that Paul is announcing here is not kind of God's gone, the Old Testament didn't work, let's have plan B. No, he says the Old Testament was always leading towards the Lord Jesus. It's always pointing towards him. The news we have here is unchanging. God has always intended to send his son. I think of that verse in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, that talks about Jesus being the Lamb of God who was slain from the creation of the world. God intended that Jesus would die from before the world began. So the gospel that Paul announces here, the gospel that we come to see each week as we come to Romans, is unchanging. It's the eternal good news that God announces, that there is salvation through faith in his Son. And this unchanging gospel is what we need to constantly hear. We are constantly liable to change, and we should want that change to be made ever more like Jesus, matured into his likeness, as we hear this unchanging good news. So the gospel is God's good news, it's it's his unchanging good news, It is God's good news about Jesus. His good news about Jesus. And here, as we look at Jesus, we find the bullseye of God's good news. Here we find its beating heart, its epicenter. Because now the good news of God is zeroed in on his Son. Look at verse 2 again. The gospel God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his Son who, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. There's masses in these verses for us to touch on. Let me simply highlight something about Jesus' humanity and something about his divinity. Jesus' humanity was, well, remarkable. Remarkable. To understand this, we've got to wind the Bible clock back a thousand years, and there we find King David, the best king the Old Testament can offer God's people. And God gives to David the most staggering promise, because he says, there's going to be a descendant coming from you who won't just sit on a throne over my people for a little while. He'll do so eternally. He will be an awesome king. He is coming. The problem is, as you then read through a thousand years worth of history for God's people in the Old Testament, one after another after another of David's descendants fail to a greater or lesser degree. None of them live up to the pattern explained here. But what do we find in Jesus? We find the one who is born in David's town, Bethlehem, as the ultimate descendant that David had been promised. He is the one who would rule over God's people eternally. There are no parallels in life to try and understand this. Strictly Come Dancing began last night on television, so the internet told me. I didn't watch it. But Strictly Come Dancing, X Factor, The Voice, Dancing on Ice, etc., etc., is all lining up candidates to say, right, who's the one? Or at least, who's the best of you lot? But this is nothing like this. In Jesus, God is saying there's only one. 
There's only one descendant of David who'll sit on my throne forever. Only he. Only he. And he's the one that God's people have been waiting for centuries. And don't miss the obvious here that Jesus came as a man. As to his, earth, his earthly nature, he was a man. And that means that he, he knows what life is like. The good news of the gospel is that God has stepped into time and space and he goes, I know what it is like to live here because Jesus has faced our pain, our suffering. He's known our joys and our delights. It should stagger us that the mighty king that God has set over his people and over this world is not unfamiliar with our frailties, but says to us, I know because he's familiar with suffering, acquainted with grief, and therefore he is mighty in compassion. And his compassion finds its greatest expression as he goes to the cross and lays down his life for us. So no wonder Paul says, I've got some good news. It's God's good news and it's about God's son because God's son became a man so that he could save us and so that he could love us. But not only is Jesus human, he's also divine. Now the Jews, as they heard of someone being described as David's descendant in the church in Rome, would have gone, I understand. The Gentiles, lots of them probably would have said, I understand. But then he turns to an event that everybody understands, that underlines the good news about Jesus, shows that he is indeed the king. Because he points us to his resurrection. Look at verse 4 again. Who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. This Jesus who was brutally murdered upon a Roman cross rose to dead three days later, not walking around as some ghost to spook people, but as a person with flesh and blood. Not just about staggering around still alive, but with a mighty resurrection body, profoundly and wonderfully different. He didn't come back to life and was hidden in a corner of a closet but he was publicly seen at one point by 500 people. What does this announce? It announces that Jesus is God's son. This awesome resurrection proves that Jesus is the son of God in power, or as the Christian Standard Version Bible puts it, the powerful son of God. He is the mighty son of God. And Paul says, he's come to save you. And he's come as king. He has been rubber stamped, proved to be God's son, as he has risen from the grave. And the simple reality is that God hasn't got a big job that he's not given to Jesus. Creation, he gave to his son. Salvation, he gave to his son. Judgment, he gives to his son. Jesus is the king. And Paul announces to us and to the church in Rome, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the one you need to know. And that little four-word summary, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is a brilliant summary of the gospel, that Jesus first up is Lord, that he is God, and therefore to be obeyed. That this Lord is Jesus, the one who walked around our world, forgave the sinful, drew close to the downcast, contended with the hypocrites. Jesus He's Christ, he's the promised king. And all these truths about Jesus are truths that both Jew and Gentile delighted in, and actually all of us know. If you're a Christian here today, Jesus is your king, and he's the king of everyone else here who knows and loves the Lord Jesus. And that brings us a profound measure of unity. It binds us together as God's people. It should give us joy and love for each other. Because this good news is about a king who is our king and who loves us dearly. Good news about Jesus. Fourthly, good news for all people. Good news for all people. Look at verse 5. Through Jesus we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. Uh, This word here translated Gentiles can also be translated nations. Paul is saying we are in speaking about the gospel talking not just to some people but to everyone because it is a gospel for everyone. You have never met a person for whom this gospel is not true. You've never met an atheist or a Buddhist, a cultist or a Jew, a Muslim, a Hindu, an agnostic, someone who's indifferent, for whom this gospel is not true. 
It is true for all people. Everyone needs to hear that Jesus is king. And he's come to save us. Even the person you think of who's most antagonistic to the gospel, they need to hear this news. Think of my neighbour who I who ended up walking back from um, town with on Friday, who back at Christmas I'd invited him to come to our Christmas services. And he said, oh, that's the kind of thing my wife might be interested in, but it's not for me. Whether the Christmas service is his cup of tea or not, I don't know. But the Jesus we announce and proclaim is the only one who can save him. And so that neighbour needs to hear of him. I need to pray on for him to hear of Jesus. Good news for all people. Finally, good news that demands a response. Good news that demands a response. I think back for a moment to that tunnel in the Baltic with me. News blaring in from every inch and every corner. So many of them had very little to do with me. None of them were really asking me to do anything. But not so with God's good news. It is a news that demands a response. And yet so vogue it is today to think of the gospel as something that's just nice to hear. But actually all the way through the ages, people have looked at the gospel as incorrectly as just nice news, not one that demands a verdict. J.C. Ryle, the great bishop of Liverpool, put it like this. There is a common worldly kind of Christianity in this day which many have and think that they have enough. A cheap Christianity which offends nobody and requires no sacrifice, which costs nothing and is worth nothing. What was true then is true today. People come and they want to hear about Jesus. I don't want to, please don't have it affect me. No, Paul says this gospel needs a response. So look at verse 5. Through Christ, through him, we've received grace and apostleship to call, to summon all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake, or the obedience of faith, the obedience of trusting. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. The gospel is a message that says, get up, there's something to do. There's a king to know and a king to obey. There's a saviour to trust. Think back for a moment to Louis Zamperini, that prisoner of war. As they heard the announcement that the war was won, it demanded a response It was quite an easy response. It was the thing they wanted to do. Leave the prison and no freedom. They had to do something. They then had to obey the instructions of how they would then get back to the States and know a life of liberty. The gospel brings a summons and a challenge to each of us. It's far harder than the challenge to Louis Zamperini to come free because it demands all that we are. It demands all that we are. But it does demand our response. It demands a response, and it's a response of both faith and obedience, trusting Jesus and obeying Jesus. And actually, the best way we obey the Lord Jesus is by trusting him to save us and trusting him as the king that we need. And as in a minute or two, Peter is baptized. Actually, his baptism is a very good illustration of the response Jesus demands. Because as Peter goes down into the pool, he's going to illustrate dying to his old way of life. He's, in baptism, he's joined with Jesus as he's laid down in the grave. And Peter's saying goodbye to my old way of life. That's what happened to me when I became a Christian. And then coming back out of the water, he's risen to a new life. It's a radical step that Peter has already taken that is pictured in baptism. And it pictures the response that each of us need to make. And the great danger is, I think, that there are people here today who come to church, and I fear that you come. And you love being here for friends. There's great friends here. You enjoy singing. You enjoy maybe even hearing a sermon. But have you responded to it? Have you said, Jesus, actually now you need to be my Lord and my King. I need to live to honour and obey you. Maybe as Peter gives his testimony, you need to be challenged to think, actually, okay, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? Because we do need to do something. Because the gospel calls everyone to the obedience of faith. And Christian, note please, if you're someone here who loves the Lord Jesus, and I know that that is many, many of us, that response of trust and obedience, faith and obedience, is not just how we became a Christian, it is then the beat to which we march all our days as a Christian. 
Trusting Jesus, obeying Jesus, trusting Jesus, obeying him. It is the beat to which we march, and it's the beat that as we march brings great joy as we know Jesus as our saviour. And it's as we learn of Jesus as our Lord, the one to whom we must respond, we grow to maturity. And it's evidenced in unity together and a desire to get out to tell others about the Lord Jesus. Come back with me one last time to the tunnel in the Baltic in Gateshead. We are bombarded with news every day. Most of it's about Brexit, isn't it? But we're bombarded with lots. What we need to do something about, what really is going to affect us, we don't always know. But today God has said, I interrupt this broadcast to bring you the most important announcement. It is about my son and how he comes to save and he comes to be king. And you need to bow the knee to him. May we this week live with our knees bowed to Jesus, knowing the great privilege of those who in verse 7 are described as those who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the good news. The good news that we find about your son, the Lord Jesus. Thank you that he was indeed descended from David. He was the promised king who came to lay down his life. Thank you that his resurrection proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that he is indeed your son and your king. We pray that we might grasp all that he is so that we would grow to greater maturity and that that maturity might express itself both in unity, loving unity as a body of your people and also a desire to reach out with the good news of Jesus too. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before the